Is it the first, the original one that we're talking about here? It's the original. The original oh. Megan Murphy. Megan E. Murphy. There's probably another Megan Murphy out there before you, before you came out of the scene, but... There, yeah, somebody, some other nobody, but actually a journalist named Megan Murphy took Megan Murphy before I got it. Mm. And I've been pretty angry about it ever since, but it makes me feel better knowing that she has to suffer probably with people <laughs> confusing me for her sometimes. <laughs> <gasps> but you're the okay, real authentic Megan Murphy. Obviously, I'm the 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 original, yeah. One of probably what, like a million? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I don't know. There's a few Benjamin Boyces out there. One's a recovering probably drug addict, more Megan uh, Murphy's, I suspect. PhD oh, really? socialist, yeah. And then another one's a British born German pop star who had a couple hits in Germany and like the nineties or something. He's older than me. He was very, very beautiful. Very, well, very beautiful man. I I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be doing this work if I had his looks. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> okay, hold on, just let me So um just to the audiences at home, I wanted to open up with this stunning and brave article about drag phobia. Which is a nothing. Wait, are article. we live right now? Yeah, we've been live for like two minutes now because people oh. have been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we weren't live yet. Well, you're the original Megan Murphy. We got to get you on your toes, off your I feet, on your I toes. I would have made an effort to be more witty if I knew we were alive. I just thought I was well, talking to you. I wasn't no, even trying. now's your chance. Now's your chance. <laughs> try harder. Just don't be a try Okay. Well, I'm gonna. Let close Firefox to make sure. I'm gonna, like, do you want to keep talking about my mic more and the sound? No, let's let's let's, let's uh, well as long as our sounds are good. Uh, and it, chat, let us know if our sounds are roughly equal. I can fix mine or hers on my end. But there's this new bigotry in town. It just dropped yesterday. Did you hear about this? <laughs> it's called drag phobia, and it's on the rise. Extremist groups and online forums who've been encouraging and planning attacks on local infrastructure and the growing number of armed confrontations around drag shows and drag library readings that have been reported all over the country are putting drag queen story hours and children book readings in danger now. Megan, how is your drag phobia? Do you have uh, it? Do you pretty not have big. It? I have a pretty big phobia of drag. Oh, okay. uh, irrational. I, fear. I actually do hate drag, but this oh. was this before was before it became a hot topic. This. Okay, I've always yeah, I've hated. I've been a long time hater of drag, huh. which I, I don't necessarily hate drag queens. I don't really know any drag queens to hate. Um, <laughs> it's more that I find. But you were never drag. a f a g h a g. That was never your thing. No, no, no that's no. never been my thing. I've been more of a straight man. Hag. Oh, a s- <laughs> cis hetero a hag. Cis hetero <laughs> hag. Okay, wait. I have to open my new mix. My fa- this is my favorite Mexican drink next to Ricea. Is this like just, Zima, south of the it border? Tastes like pop. It tastes like a. It's like soda water and orange. Put it right in front of your face so the camera can see it. Right in front of her. New mix. Mineral. How much oh. of my face can you see? Just this part? Um, you have a little bit of wiggle room, but not too much because we're sharing a screen now. Oh, we have to share. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it tastes like a, a nice, not too sugary soda. So I feel like I could probably drink like eight of them before I felt anywhere oh, near drunk. Okay. And you're, you're not spiking it tonight? Not at the moment. I have, okay. I have. I have to go out and about later. I've I've got like another. I've got until I've got to go until like five a.m. tonight. So I've got to oh, you know wow. pace myself. <laughs> well, are, you, are you going to drag queen story hour hopping? No, it's Thursday night is karaoke night here. <laughs> and you go till five a.m. Yeah, the bar stays open. The bar the bar that hosts the karaoke night that my friend Zach hosts who's my only friend who got a name drop on Joe Rogan and probably my only friend who doesn't give any single shits about Joe Rogan, <laughs> <laughs> which I found funny, but I love him. He's a big weirdo. Um, uh, but yeah, like normally the bar closes at two, but it stays open until 5 a.m. just for karaoke because okay. we love 
karaoke so much. How many people about show up? 50? I mean, it totally depends. Like yep. in the in the low season in the summer, there were nights when there were quite few of us. But now it's getting busier. I don't. I've been gone. I just. I was in. I was in Tulum for like three weeks. So I just got back home here to Salida on late on Monday night. So I think I'm assuming there's probably a lot more tourists in town now. That Isn't it's karaoke been... just drag for rock stars? Well. I feel that carry I feel that the fun of karaoke is that people are bad at it. So it actually kind of like is annoying if people are actually good because it's oh, like, really? oh, yeah. okay, this is not your show. This is our show. <laughs> like it's supposed to be I feel I feel the best way to do karaoke is to like really, really, really go for it, but not take it too seriously. Like okay. go hard, but you're not you have to be laughing at yourself at the same time. Okay. What's what's Pro- your uh, top ten or top two? Um, I usually do "Oh Darlin," like the Beatles. How, how's it go? Oh, darling, darling. Mm-hmm. if you mm-hmm. leave me, mm-hmm. I'll never do you no harm. Do, okay, do you that's do, all. <laughs> how do you <laughs> do? You really lean into the performance no, I and feel like I'm blushing. I usually I I try to yell the whole thing. That's my strategy. <laughs> I've always like lost my voice by the end of it because there's some screamy wow. parts too. Okay, yeah. Where are you tell that part? Yeah. Do you know the Beatles? Uh, the Beatles uh, are right. Yeah, my my parents hated the Beatles, so I didn't get exposed to them until later. Yeah, my hated dad. Uh, the Beatles. My my dad has very particular tastes in uh, secular oh. media, which is he hates it all. Um, and uh, the oh, Beatles. Okay. When John Lennon said that they were bigger than Jesus, Dad just like that was God. that. Yeah, that was that for my. My papa father. The Beatles are the greatest band of all time. Uh, no, they're yep. not. Rolling yep. Stones. No, no, no. Rolling Stones. Uh, uh, I've had this debate with so many people. And I love the Rolling Stones. The Rolling yeah. Stones are a great band. So it, it's a frustrating debate to have because I don't, don't want to like diss the Stones because I like them. Yeah. But objectively, the Beatles are the greatest band of all time in terms of quality and quantity. Like the amount of high quality singles and albums like that were so good that they just yeah. there's so much of it and it's all so not all but mostly i mean except for the ringo songs mostly all so they're such good songs yeah, isn't that so weird? many of them you know what if if you took away that the blues you wouldn't have the rolling stones but you might have a version of the beatles without the blues. right yeah yeah well the beatles not early, early beatles, on but... took a lot of kind of like oldies no. songs and made them their own like black girl groups oh really they went black girl black girl groups like um i'm trying to think of there's oh god i'm not gonna be able to remember there's a couple beatles songs that are some of their early songs that i really like that were originally done by black girl groups from like the 60s okay um do like we have Mr. a live Postman. chat yeah, we do. Um, like that style, kind of, yeah. Yeah, we do. I mean... Um, yeah. But the Rolling yeah. Stones are definitely in pretty much one genre, whereas the Beatles, as they progressed, they branched out yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. A I little just bit think more that, color there. Yeah. I think that they were a more productive, better... I think they produced a higher amount of better quality, really widely enjoyable songs yeah as a as a recovering uh wannabe artist it always amazed me the the amount of uh genius or you know just inspiration that uh, Mc, uh paul and uh to a lesser extent john had yeah just, i mean were, i think george something. harrison is amazing too i love george harrison is that but they were beetle? all again except for ringo they were all, all i really don't like ringo <laughs> Why not? He was in He's Thomas the Tank Engine, He's got a horrible he? voice, and all of his songs were awful. Like, the only Beatles songs that I don't like are Ringo songs. Okay, yeah. Like, Octopus's Garden, Yellow Submarine. Um, too ch- childlike? Too uh, kids' music? <laughs> okay, anthem-like? Yeah. Not your thing. Okay, so, but drag so you, you never liked drag right. even before it became a moral panic like because yeah. uh the highly effeminate gay man embracing and celebrating their uh parody of uh femininity 
just always rubbed you wrong? Is that one for me? I did find it quite misogynistic. Um, I also was annoyed because it's sort of similarly as to what happened with burlesque um, around the time burlesque started to become quite popularized in, let's say, the hipster scene. Um, well, so it was, Vancouver, it, yeah, probably 2005 back So, But that, that resurgence, that, that Gen X resurgence of burlesque, or maybe even millennial resurgence of uh, burlesque, was taking an older form and then updating it, right? So I don't know the history of burlesque, but I know it comes from probably the 19, what, uh, 1910s, 1920s, something like that. I, yeah, I believe the burlesque came around because like an actual strip club was illegal. Like you couldn't actually get naked. So there was the tease. They were like almost oh, yeah. naked and looking and the like A's, they were yeah. about to get naked, but you couldn't actually be naked. So that's how they kind of got around that then. Um, but I guess like I, I, what a big thing that annoyed me about that. And then similarly as to what happened with drag was that it was sprung on me. Like I would be at, um, a show like to see bands right like I'd be at the bar to see like rock bands and then all of a sudden there'd be a burlesque show and I was like I did not come here for burlesque like this is not fair to just push this on me and they would do the same thing with drag and I was like these people are not fucking talented at all oh, okay. like they're f- so much less talented than the bands there would usually be like female performers and female singers who were exceedingly more talented, but the drag queens and or the burlesque dancer would get all of the cheers as if they were doing something amazing and they weren't doing anything amazing. Like they were so very skillless. Well, isn't Um, that, isn't that similar again to uh, lip syncing? What's it called? Karaoke? I mean, it's basically kind of the same concept where people are exalting the mediocrity in a way. No, because the drag queens and the burlesque dancers think they're very good. When oh. you go to karaoke, I don't know, maybe some people do, but I think most people don't think that they're like really good at karaoke <laughs> if they're not. <laughs> not good at like it. I don't I, I don't like I don't think I'm good at karaoke. I know that I'm like killing it in a negative way, not in a positive way. Yeah, but, but, but people are cheering you on, and, right? And people are like, they're expressing, they're releasing you're their on energy. You're putting a performance a bit, yeah. right? Like you're putting, you're still putting on a show because yeah. otherwise it's, it's not fun to watch. Like either if you're good at it and you're putting on a show that should be entertaining or if you're bad at it and you're putting on a show and kind of laughing at yourself, that should be entertaining or you should be engaging the crowd. Like, Part of doing good at karaoke is choosing songs that the crowd will like and want to yeah. sing along with it. Yeah. Like it's, I okay. find it very rude when someone goes up and often like the, the Gen Zers do this cause they're completely clueless about songs that normal people in real life actually <laughs> know. So they'll choose some song that only like a, a 19 year old would have ever heard of. And everybody's like, what the fuck is this weird pop rap song? Like, Sing a Beatles song. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, or yeah, Queen yeah. or like, okay. you know, there's lots, there's lots of options there, but you have to choose something more universal instead of getting up there and being like, okay, everybody. It's, I literally don't even know what Gen Z listens to that, to the point where I was almost like Justin Bieber, but I bet it's not <laughs> even that. I don't even think <laughs> like, it's Britney Spears. I don't, I don't know. I don't no, know. What they no. would say. I mean, Britney Spears would be more acceptable because she is more widely known. Yeah. I don't That's a bit annoying too. You should be choosing sort of like older songs or well-known like rock songs or yeah. pop songs or funny songs. I don't like... think music's meant to be sung along to. Well, no. I mean, there's Taylor Swift. There, she's got that one song. Uh, oh, get modern. It, music. Set it off. Get it off. What? A, what I don't know a single Taylor Swift song. Okay, yeah. Not a single. I don't think I do anyway. I don't think know? I've ever heard a Taylor Swift song. Ooh, ooh, ooh. No. It's got almost like is. 5 million or billion views on YouTube. It's like one of the most watched videos on YouTube. You should watch it on repeat uh, several, several times. I can't think of the I don't name like right po- now. I don't <laughs> like modern <laughs> pop music. It's so boring. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this it is doesn't, doesn't it's, not, it's not meant to last. It's fast food, you know? Mm-hmm. It's meant mm-hmm. to exist and disappear. Mm-hmm. Whereas the music of pre-our time was, had more longevity. Well, how do you produce content that doesn't disappear then? Or do you care? Like, we're both content creators. I do think you, my content, content will probably a... disappear. Yeah. No. To produce content that you want not to disappear, I think you have to write a book 
And it has to be a book that's so relevant and historic that people will continue to use it for reference in the future. Mm, okay. It's probably not hard to do. Or it probably is hard to do. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm doing first draft of history work, as are you, with the way that you're chronicling certain voices and stuff like that. My Detransitioner series, my Evergreen series, are, I, I won't be remembered for them, but the events will be remembered because of me, right? So I'm kind of like the footnote that is putting up uh, the mm -hmm, material for mm -hmm. other people to, to think about. I mean, I don't like, I don't want, I don't produce stuff thinking, oh, this is just going to disappear forever. Like, obviously it would be nice for it to stick around. Like actually a big reason that I keep feminist current going, despite the fact that I've sort of moved on into other arenas have, quite yeah. a bit yeah. is because it's an archive of women's voices over a decade, right? Yeah. Because I've just, I've interviewed so many women and, you know, women have published there also, but I think more so the interviews are these just women in the movement, like women who really? were fighting prostitution, fighting violence against women. Um, fighting burlesque. You know, fighting burlesque. <laughs> um, obviously, women involved in the fight for women's sex-based rights and against yeah. gender identity ideology. So... I, I, it's, I think I like I think it has to be like the biggest archive of feminist interviews ever because I don't know. Do you know, know like the word count or how many uh, articles? Do you know the stats of how much you have on this site? Well, no, but it, I mean, if I were to guess, <clears throat> say I produced a podcast every month, that's like twelve a year times ten. Oh What's wow! That? You were doing podcasts the whole time. I thought it was mostly just writing. I didn't know that. No, I've been doing. I've been doing the podcast for longer than the writing. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Mm. Where did Where did you start with the with the podcast part? Did you like just start mouthing off into a uh, microphone, or did you uh, start interviewing right away? I started working with a feminist collective, which I oh. recommend no one ever do, <laughs> ever. It was fucking hell. I like working against them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> I mean, just for their own sake, not because they're capable of actually getting anything done and doing anything in the world or, you know, doing any damage to anything. They're completely mm. incapable. Hmm. Um, hmm. That's the nature of collectives, I think, hmm. for hmm. the most part, but especially feminist <laughs> Well, I think, you know what? Not, <laughs> Never I, get anything uh, done and then dissolve in fights over power but pretend that nobody has any power because you all have equal power and there's no such thing as hierarchy hmm. right i tend to agree with you but the but in the in britain right now there's a uh, a growing movement of of women's voices that are tied together kind of not in a collective there's something where their purpose is not to collectivize but to get crap done um, around the Gender Recognition Act, around uh, women's rights, right? So there's a women's rights network in Britain that is doing a lot of good work. They're making a lot but of... But are they uh, working as a collective? I guess I'm not that's saying that the, women are incapable yeah, of getting anything yeah. done. But, but it, it's a collection of women, but it's not a collective. So what, what <clears throat> was this collective that you were involved in? I mean, the point of a collective, like a feminist collective, is meant to have no hierarchy. So all decisions happen through consensus okay so nobody's supposed to be in charge there's not supposed to be any leader everyone's supposed to have an equal say and you can't you make a decision you can't do fucking feminist probably weird or maybe marxists anarchists yeah it seems a bit anarchist there's a pun on right? consensus that i don't want to yeah supposedly. yeah well probably but you anarchists were, were you into the anti-hierarchy thing yeah like yeah, when you were working at Starbucks and doing and, your podcast, you're like, I just want to. And wanna... I thought that, I thought that hierarchy was like imposed and learned through socialization and not necessarily natural. And I thought that it would be better to operate, you know, as a collective and everybody had equal say, but you know, that doesn't work. You can't get anything done if every decision you make has to be based on consensus where everyone agrees. Because there's inevitably going to be people who don't agree, but there's also inevitably going to be people who want to hold back the process because they have their own weird power issues or personality issues or they want to bully everybody else or they want attention or they're narcissists or whatever. There's always terrible 
personalities in these collectives who hmm. hold everybody else hostage, right? Um, but it's, yeah, it's supposed to focus, fo function as like a true democracy kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is the best be, form of government, as we all know. <laughs> obviously. Obviously. Um, I never like, think otherwise. But so, <laughs> wait, so 10 years ago you started this or 12 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago is when I started Feminist Current, but pre-Feminist Current, I was working with a feminist collective at Vancouver Co-op Radio. So I was producing a feminist radio show at the Co-op Radio station in Vancouver with these other women. So yeah, I was doing interviews then and we started podcasting <coughs> with rabble.ca, which I at some point abandoned because a bunch of people petitioned to have me fired over you. whore phobia and transphobia. Yeah, this was in wait whore phobia twenty fifteen. Not only I, I have a, I have so I, many phobias. <laughs> it's hard whore to keep phobia. Up. Like I, there's so many. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning so much today. I, okay, I, I'm critical of the system of prostitution. I think that men shouldn't pay for sex. I think that it should be illegal to buy sex. Well, we pay one way or another, Megan. <laughs> You sure do. I'll tell you that. Tell much. me about it. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about it. But how long? When? When did you start to get this uh, itchiness against the collectivism or feminist-based collectivism? Was it pretty early on? Did it just? Were you just frustrated, or did you start to see yourself acting in a way that was just unproductive and more mean girl because you were had, forced into through? No, I. I mean, I had a horrible experience working with this collective and determined that I would never work with a collective ever again. Oh wow! Because we couldn't get anything done. Like I, I wanted to. Like to me, I was prioritizing the work, and they were prioritizing the process. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I was like, "Let's go. Let's get this done. Let's do this. Like, let's get a website. Let's. I want to publish this. Like, let's interview this person. Let's get the podcast here." But everything had to be decided at a meeting, and people hemmed and hawed, and I. And it was so frustrating to me. So I couldn't really, I felt like I was being trapped, but also that the work that we were producing was not quality because of this whole consensus collective process. And then at the end of the day, what happened was we did this, 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 this series of interviews. This was in 2011 about the trans debate, you know, that about, early. okay. Yeah. About, the you know i was interested in in this this debate around protecting women's spaces versus the trans activists who were obviously saying that trans women were women and should be allowed access to these spaces so i started interviewing and speaking with women who could articulate an analysis of that and why women women only spaces were important like what what the you know shelter house movement like feminists in the second wave created transition houses and shelters for women who were escaping domestic abuse and and rape and things like that and there's obviously or it should be obvious not to some clearly um why those spaces should be women only um and this debate, I was sort of just newly encountering this debate in like 2010, 2011. And I, so I wanted to sort out my own thoughts about it. So I was talking to different people and trying to figure it out. Um, but, and, and so we talked to people from different sides. Um, I talked to Sheila Jeffries and Lee Lakeman, who headed up Vancouver Rape Relief for decades. Um, and some of my co-collective women talked to, um, I think one of them talked to Susan Stryker, who's like a trans academic. Um, and then somebody talked to another trans activist. I can't remember who it was. So we were going to produce these like series of podcasts that would show both sides equally. And at the end of the day, the other collective women got freaked out and pulled the podcast and wouldn't oh. let me put it out there. And we're like, we don't want to, it's just too controversial and part of it was like issues that they were having with other collective members and all that drama and then I think just being freaked out about what would happen if they produced these like very fair interviews showing both sides where we weren't even as a collective taking a side yeah, yeah, we were yeah, taking yeah. other people we were talking other people having interviews and so and then and I was really angry about this obviously and then they like locked me out of all the accounts without oh. telling me or wow. one one woman did she just like kicked me out of she was the one who opened all the accounts so she just decided to like kick me out unceremoniously 
Wow, you got canceled before cancel culture was a thing. Wow. I've been at this for a very long time. <laughs> I mean, they were cowards and idiots, and it was all for the best anyway, because then I was free to start my own thing. <clears throat> but so, but when you started down, your own thing, but... it was still a feminist current. Yeah, so you still then I had, started you... feminist current. So when I got kicked out of this collective, I started feminist current. Yeah, so you still <clears> had a feminist analysis. Yeah, that was what the purpose. The purpose of feminist current was basically to for a feminist analysis but particularly you know a criticism of third wave feminism and more of a like radical feminist analysis but then also just to like share the voices of all these women from around the world who wouldn't have any other platform otherwise you know most mm -hmm. of them were unpublished most of them were unknowns uh, most of them would never have gotten any space to be interviewed in any other kind of media right mm -hmm. So as much as I've moved on to other things and I have other interests in a lot of ways, um, not in all ways, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's important to keep it as like a historic hmm. archive. Right? You think you're going to stop it and just have it there, just pulsing in the cloud? Maybe eventually I might, you know, I might morph it into something different or it might take a different form or something like that. Or it might just stop and exist. Um, I don't really know. Like, I, th I still want to keep doing it. Like, I like it to exist. I think it's important that it exists, especially since we're still in this fight for women's sex-based rights and women's spaces. And we're still fighting against gender identity legislation. You know, it was mm. the only place in Canada that was really talking about this stuff. Yeah. When but you're not even in happening. Canada anymore. Thank God. Yeah. You're free. Somebody on Twitter today said, maybe even in response to our live announcement, I can't recall exactly, but said, Megan, you seem like a lot happier than last time you were on Twitter. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, as in when I got kicked off in 2018. Is it just me or is that true? And I was like, that is very true. Hmm. Like, I think that when I think back to that time in 2018 when I was kicked off, I think I was so stressed out. Yeah? Yeah. I think, because that was sort of at the height of, you know, I was doing talks in Vancouver and we were getting protested and the media was libeling me and I was getting attacked all over the place and my friends were being fucking so shitty in Vancouver and social stuff was awkward and it was like... My boyfriend would get to, invited to a thing, but then his friend's girlfriend didn't want me there because I was a <laughs> oh, transphobe. No. Oh, and no. like my friends would be like, you know, like, I don't know. I think I think we just have different politics. And um, my friend says, so um, I don't know. You're making it really awkward for me. <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, okay, so me having opinions that your friend doesn't like makes things awkward for you. And I need to figure out a way to deal with that, eh? Not you. Guilt by association. Yeah. yeah. It's been very effective. But also, effective I mean, who says point. that? What kind of adult, adult woman? Like, can you imagine saying to your friend, you know, I don't think I can continue being friends with you if you continue to be friends with her. Like, that's a very teenager-y thing to say. I don't know. It kind of rules the discourse at a certain, uh, at a certain level, at a certain, actually very high level. You're not supposed to uh, fraternize with the enemy. I know you're uh, not supposed to, but I find it very immature. It's like lacking in healthy boundaries. I think it's like codependent. Like, mm -hmm. you need to fix my uncomfortable feelings instead of you being like, Okay, I feel uncomfortable about this. Whatever, that's my problem. I need to figure out how to deal with this. You're making yeah. it somebody else's problem when well, it's not their problem. Well, or yeah, shouldn't but be. they're they're trying to save face, and I guess it's different be between like somebody telling you that in private and then or going on Twitter and denouncing you for yeah. one thing or another. Two different kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, Levels and of and of course during that time there was all sorts of people talking shit about me on social media. Some of whom were people that I knew. You know, either not very well or like... What was the I talk of the shit that you were getting talked about? It was all the, around the trans debate. You know, I was yeah. transphobic and terrible and had to be denounced. <clears throat> and I was also in a stressful, shitty relationship. And, and I also think that looking back at that time, 
I I don't think Vancouver is a very happy place. It was at one point. Was it? I don't know. It's Pacific <laughs> Northwest. It, it seems like there was a golden era of the Pacific Northwest. I mean, I was happy living there for a long time, I suppose. Um, at a certain point, I think that I think that everybody got priced out. <clears throat> mm. So a lot of my friends started moving away. Um, and a lot of people who were coming in were coming in from other places and just wanted to sort of exist in their little condos. So they didn't really feel like there were neighborhoods or community anymore. Like there were there were a lot of times in my life where, you know, I lived in my neighborhood and if I left the house to go out to the bar, I'd see all my friends there where I'd walk mm -hmm. down the street and I'd run into people I knew. Right. Mm -hmm. And that stopped happening. Um, and I, but I, at the same time, I think that people in, in retrospect, I don't think I realized this at the time. I've realized this more since living somewhere that's not like this. Um, you know, people in Vancouver care a lot about what other people think about them which I don't like. I think I don't think that's an attractive quality. It <clears> tends <throat> to be about... in my interviews with Canadians or dissident Canadians, it tends to be one of the critiques that they have is that everybody wants to be agreeable to a fault. That's why the country is headed in the direction of authoritarian uh, maple China territory because everybody just wants to do the right thing and be nice and not step on anybody's Yeah, and it's toes not really and... okay to be not like that. Like if you are the kind of person who goes against the grain and says what they really think you're, it's again, it's like you're making things really uncomfortable for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so please stop doing that. Um, but also very sceny. Like it's like you, you want to be with people who have status, social status, and they're not necessarily very interesting or cool people. They're just people who for whatever reason have social status and I don't really care about that. <laughs> like, okay, you don't care about that. I probably I don't did think at it's one possible. Point. I mean, I care about it, but I don't care about it. I think we're similar in that way, but well, I know I have to I'm not interested in care hanging out around people who are just like yeah. cool for no reason. Like, oh, you have yeah, yeah. to have okay. more yeah. than that. Like, yeah. I just want to be around normal people. Yeah, but cool normal people, not just boring. I mean, I'm people. still a snob. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but that's I'm not I'm a snob about things like money or okay. like status. Yeah. But... I'm just a snob around if I think you're a fucking nerd, I don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> really? You don't like nerds now? <laughs> people you misunderstand what I mean by nerd, nerd because you probably think you're a nerd, list. but I don't think you're a nerd. When I say nerd, I mean somebody who's like, I don't, I don't like people who are, <clears throat> I really, well, this isn't going to describe a nerd in any way at all, but people who <laughs> try too hard, people who are trying too hard to fit in, people who are trying too hard to be cool, but they're not really being themselves. I don't like people who are phony. I just want people who are going to be normal and be themselves. I don't want to be around people who are going to make me feel like I can't be myself. Like if they're going to look at me weird because I say something rude or vulgar or burp too loud, like... Yeah, I'm trying to suppress that on camera. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start burping soon. Anytime I drink anything carbonated, it's really uncontrollable. <laughs> did, did you ever do the Tinder thing in, in Vancouver? Uh, I hate Tinder. I mean, I think like there was a couple times where I went on it briefly, mostly because my friends kept encouraging me to try it. And I'd go on for like half an hour and be like, I fucking hate this. Um, I think just during COVID really, because it was obviously so hard to meet people. And uh, during COVID I had gone through a breakup with this like real Nerd. asshole. Yeah. He was like a super narcissist. Um, so hmm. I was like pretty fucked up about the end of that. And then it was COVID. So you couldn't like go out and meet anybody. And I was like, I need somebody to like touch my body. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> any in any way at all <laughs> you know what i mean like but at the same time i'm I'm not the kind of person who's just gonna go out and have sex with a stranger ever no. like no you know like i'm not gonna invite for, I'm, ne I'm never gonna invite a stranger over to my house i'm probably not gonna go out on a date with a stranger like you know the people that i've dated or slept with for the most part have been like my friends right like people that i already know or that i've met through friends of friends i'm not really into this how many karaoke stuff. nights before before somebody's gonna hit third base with you megan murphy like right now 
No, I'm just saying, like, like theoretically, how many karaoke nights would somebody have to? Um, I mean, it depends on if I knew, maybe, like, if I knew them from somewhere else, and maybe we'd already made out or something, and then they were at karaoke night, I'd probably go home with them that night. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but if, if if you just saw a guy show up to karaoke, I'm how in many a on average? Right now, for the record. Okay. So okay. That's for the I record. Okay. Like, Right. Uh, <laughs> none. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> hmm. Um, but yeah, it would be somebody that I'd sort of hung out with already, that I knew a bit already, that knew some of my friends, had people to vouch for them a bit. Yeah. Right? So ten- you know Tinder I mean? is not the medium through which you would uh, gauge the. I'm not an online dater yeah. now, and I think Tinder is bad for everybody. I don't think anybody should use Tinder. I know why people do, and people get mad when I say that, because they're like, but I'm lonely, how do I meet somebody? Or like, I'm socially awkward. Like, I've never found it very hard to meet people. I, you know, you just go out and talk to people, and hmm. there you go. But I understand that it's hard for some people, or people live in places where they don't know very many people, or they feel isolated or whatever, so they don't really have much choice. So it's not like I'm judging that, per se. Like, I'm not necessarily judging the why of why some people would go on Tinder. But I do think it's a very unhealthy way to engage, to start a relationship, to meet people, to see the world around you, to spend your time. I think it's really bad for your brain. Um, you know, they, they're they built like, I've probably talked to you about this before, maybe a long time ago, but they're built like, they're designed like slot machines intentionally. That was the plan to keep people swiping. Like, so you swipe, 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 jackpot. Like there's a match. And it sends those endorphins to your brain. Mm, mm-hmm. And then you get into sort of an addiction with it, right? And the, the goal of the app is to keep you on the app. The goal of the app isn't to say, oh, you got a match, go on a date, stay off the app now. Now you've, you've found your love. It's to keep you going forever. And so you hit a high and then you get a low. You hit a high and then you get a low. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I mean, people act like attraction is only surface but attraction is about all this other subconscious stuff that is happening when you're interacting with somebody in real life when you're seeing somebody in real life and you're making eye contact with them or you can like smell them yeah obviously or their body the language or yeah. their voice or yeah. like all these super subtle things that none most of us probably aren't even aware are going on right have you ever studied that, the game are you aware of this have you studied uh, the game is that Neil Strauss? Uh, it's it. It was this. It was this else? thing. I was I was talking to a, a friend of mine who surprised me. He turned out to be like a total nerd gone super player by using this thing called the game because he couldn't get you know he couldn't get any. Mm-hmm. And and what the game is is uh, I'm gonna butcher this a little bit, but a, like these these groups or these clades of kind of nerdy autistic guys started mm-hmm. to document their interactions with women at bars and came up with a set of rules in order to get women. Like they came up with these set, set of rules where they'd go to these bars and they'd say, okay, go up to her and just start, start a conversation. Just go up and start a conversation. And they figured out what worked best algorithmically into this thing called the game. And so it's kind of like the pre-manosphere uh, red pill kind of thing. It is, but the book, I was right, it is Neil Strauss. The, the book, The Game, is written by Neil Strauss. And I actually, I didn't read The Game, but I read his second book where he realizes how fucked up it all was and is trying to deal with all his, like, really Did he become Muslim? attachment behaviors. Did he? Okay. Maybe. I, I mean, so. I haven't followed yeah. him that closely, but I found that, that book quite interesting. The Game, Penetrating the Secret Society of Pickup Artists. Yeah. Was his first go. book. But he, you know, he'd lost, he was trying, he had a girlfriend and he was trying to keep her, but he had the, all these horrible instincts when it came to maintaining a relationship because he had all these attachment issues. So his instinct was to cheat and fuck it up and push her away and lie hmm. and do all this toxic stuff. And he was like fighting that. And he'd sort of recognized that the game was actually really unhealthy and that he was like a pretty toxic 
guy. But I mean, I mean, who knows how much of it was authentic? Who knows if he just well, my wanted, the friend that I spoke to, to and I want to interview so. him, but he doesn't want this attention on him because it might mess up his other work. Brilliant, brilliant, wonderful guy. But he did this for a few years, and he told me this wonderful story where he walked into this New York bar wearing like a like this huge mink robe, and he just bursts onto the scene, and he turns the whole bar that was just at a normal bar level up into a super party, and he starts just manipulating the entire crowd. It was this series of magic tricks. But then whenever he tried to get into a relationship, he, he saw that he wasn't being himself anymore. He's always playing the game. He's always playing mm. the game. So he had habituate, habituated himself to get something that can be got by playing by certain rules, but keeping something is a completely other game, which made him super depressed. And he went through a whole crisis of identity because he had built his identity around gaining access to women, but not really understanding what it means to be with a woman. Right, because it's fake and it's dishonest. And like what you actually need to be in a healthy relationship and to maintain the relationship is honesty and authenticity and transparency. And, you know, you can't just maintain. Vulnerability. You can't just, vulnerability. Yeah. Opening you know, up your feelings. We've been speaking about this ever about since we've ever since we've been speaking. Like, like it's like, why why do men not want to talk about their feelings? I why know. don't you want to talk about your feelings? I wanna I'll all I want to talk about is feelings. <laughs> <laughs> all I, I could talk about feelings twenty four hours a day. What's your favorite feeling? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a hierarchy of feelings? I like I no, I've never thought about that. But I I mean, no, I can't I don't think I can answer that cuz if I'm like my favorite feeling I suppose would be like amusement. Like I like weird stuff and laughing. I really like talking shit about people. Like I like <laughs> oh, no. I like jokes. Oh, no. I like when I but I like when pe I like when people kind of pick on me and we're kind of like razzing each other but that's not that wouldn't be the kind of feeling that you would talk about with your boyfriend like make fun of me more <laughs> you don't pick on me enough <laughs> tell me i'm fat <laughs> wait do you have a brother i know you're close with your no, dad but no no brothers I have a but sister. Yeah. yeah i yeah it's weird because i didn't grow up around a lot of men like it was just it was my dad you, you've and my expressed mom. that you're pretty close to your dad no, I'm not. You always think that, but I'm not. I don't really? know why, who you're confusing me with or what other redhead has a good relationship well, no. with their dad, but it's not me. Did I seem like somebody who didn't have daddy issues, Benjamin? Oh, God. <laughs> you're not supposed you can say all the things that I can't say, but okay. Like who would write feminist I current if she didn't too, have to be fair. Okay, yeah, like parental <laughs> issues, yeah. But I mean real big dad issues. <laughs> I, yeah, and so it was just, it was my mom and my dad and then my sister, who's actually my twin, but she's my fraternal twin, so we don't look alike and we're I quite different. I did not different. know you had a twin. That's so crazy. I feel crazy. like nobody knows, and then when I tell people, they're like, wait, what? Well, That's how so have you rare not mentioned and this magical. Before? You're like a unicorn. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, I am like a unicorn. Sorry, I should Does have your, more Without expensive. doxing or violating your sister's privacy, what direction did her life go? Because your life's taking... My like, sister was a dancer, and she became a Pilates instructor. And okay. she was married, and she has two kids. And oh. in fact, this is a really weird story. My sister married my first boyfriend's older brother, but they didn't know each other at the time, and I didn't even really know the brother. Like, I think I'd, the brother and the my boyfriend... This is when I was, like, 20, 21 or something like that. Wait, your first they, boyfriend was when you were 20? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 20. You, you were dating boys in high school? In high school, no. Um, <laughs> right after high school, I started sleeping around a lot. And <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> uh, a lot. That's where I got most of my numbers in, like 17 Body to count. 19 kind of thing. Okay. There's wow, a, okay. other numbers too, but yeah. I think that happens to a lot of women. If you listen to Bridget Phetasy talk about this, I feel like we had sort of similar stories in that regard. Um, Did you have you was, spoken with her? Have you guys? Uh, we're in touch podcasted? all the time. Okay, yeah, yeah. She she wrote uh, kind of a beautiful. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it was a regret piece about her body. Yeah, I regret being a slut. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, yeah she's my friend. We like text regularly. Um, 
What what, I, what is one? What were you seeking through the sluttiness? Validation and attention and love, but I didn't realize it. Um, I think that it's like when I was a teenager, I was super super insecure about my body and just in general. I was really skinny and I always felt like not sexy and. And your sister? My sister was. Did you compare uh, yourself quiet, to her? That's what I guess I'm I mean, okay. my sister never had boyfriends either. Um, like Did she worry I feel about like when she... she got married, that was like her first boyfriend. Although I don't know if that's true. We weren't super close during that time. Um, <clears throat> but, you weren't close but, to your twin. No, we didn't get along for a long time. We started huh. getting along better once we didn't have to live together. But you know, she moved yeah. away when we were eighteen to New York. Um, then moved to Colorado and then I think finally moved back to Vancouver around when I was like 25, well, when we were like 25, 26. So all that time I wasn't close with her during our early twenties, which was, you know, so she'd never met that she wasn't close to my boyfriend or his family or anything like that. They just met randomly years later, which was very strange. But anyway, I, yeah, so I think, and so I think once I like started to feel more confident and like you start drinking. So you kind of loosen up and I grew boobs, which was very exciting. And so obviously <laughs> I wanted to show them to everybody. Okay. You know, like, I don't think this is an uncommon story and I'm, I'm, I'm like pretty, I'm pretty critical of this, <laughs> the part of like, like I, it was during third wave feminism. And so women, young women were taught that like, Women can and should have sex like okay, men. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I just have to push against this. We're friends. But you're like <laughs> blaming, you're blaming society for your own behavior. No, that's something I mean, that you abhor in in certain well, levels of feminist analysis, right? It's like uh, kinda, society I mean, made me do it. I do. Do you really think society that? made me do it? But of course, that's a, that, that messaging had an impact. But it was okay. all. I mean, I was 17 years old. I didn't fucking know anything about how I should be acting. Okay. How, who, how would I know that at 17? Who, who would I, who would have taught me that besides society and my peers? Well, I guess parenting and, uh, maybe they yeah. failed, <laughs> Yeah. but like, I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but like I thought and told myself that what I wanted was not commitment, that I didn't need a boyfriend that, you know, like I also was kind of full of myself, I think, and like thought, oh, I can get anybody I want and kind of got off on that feeling of power. Yeah, yeah. And when you feel like you don't have power, then that does feel powerful. And I'm sorry, but that is a societal thing. Like girls aren't offered very much in the form of power at that age besides their sexualization, their ability to get men, like objectification. And then they're told that it's empowering to be slutty and to self-objectify. And they do it and they feel a short-term sense of power, but it doesn't last. And it yeah. doesn't actually provide confidence, but you're told that it will by society. So, uh, yeah, I mean, now, obviously, I can take more responsibility for my life and I'm wiser and I know that my choices are my responsibility. But at 17 and 18, you don't fucking know, I don't think. Well, so when I you go do, back to lucky. that, when I, when I go back to that period of my life and I look at all the mistakes that I made, I never think that it's society that caused me to make the mistakes that I made. It, I would say that it was my anger at society that caused me to make uh, the mistakes that I made. It was the main anger at my dad. It was, it was something inside of me that caused me to very briefly be a effectual or a womanizer in, in actual, um, action. Uh, now I'm just a virtual womanizer, but like I would, I would do that. And, and all the things that I did, um, it was, it was something in me. It wasn't something in society. I, I, I found that I could get away with this stuff, but I was rebelling against society. I was rebelling against the order that was given to me. But my background is coming from Christian, you know, pastor's kid. You know, I was, this stuff was, morality was drilled into me and I was going the other way. So that might be a part of it. But when I go back and I rewrite that story or I retell that story to myself, it's something in me. It's not something in society. Society's always been 
And I mean, it comes from insecurity. So insecurity comes from within me, but I didn't know how to not be insecure then. I didn't know what to do with my life to make me feel better. Like I didn't know. Okay. <clears throat> I, you learn that through trial and error. That's okay. the whole joy of getting older is you figure yeah. out what will make you into a good person and what will make you feel good about yourself and what will, you know, inspire pride in yourself and self-confidence but you have to learn that you're not ingrained with that i don't think you're gonna know that stuff when you're 17 mm. 18 19 i mean that, some people part are of the, lucky and they don't have to deal with that some until people are 40, lucky you know? i mean i've met some young people who seem to have it together but i think most people that age don't really know what they're doing and probably don't know what they're doing for a lot of their 20s okay so when i told my story uh to to pair up with your story i i mentioned anger and i should add sadness i was sad and i was mad those are two definite emotions you said insecurity which i felt doesn't mad seem... too i was really mad i was really angry at my dad i was really angry at my parents and i just wanted to get out and I didn't really have the means to get out. I didn't have any money. I obviously was working, but like I was yeah. barely making enough money to pay my own rent, you know, and I did move out at like 18 or 19 or something like that. But I'm trapped at home with these people that I think are really oppressive and hmm. toxic. And like I had a, I thought my dad was an asshole and was just angry so I would like want to go out and get drunk and get in fights and probably behave in toxic ways. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Footnote, side note, bar fight, Megan Murphy, 19. Bar fight, 20, 2021. Can we have a bar fight story? Because we got the Fern story. I want another Megan Murphy bar oh, fight story. Fern dude. story. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get in bar fights. I mean, I, well, I, know, I try you not used to in any I just want to hear mean, a bar I'm... fight story. <laughs> I've been, I'm more of a like mean girl though. You should know that I'm more just like rude. Okay. I'm more likely to say like, I've kicked people out of bars here for sure. Like I've been like, get the fuck out. You can't be here. But I've not punched. Wait, are you a bouncer? Punched. No, I just don't like the, what they're doing. So okay. I don't let them in the bar. And if I feel like I have consensus from some other people in the bar community or my friend who's working at the bar, then be like, get the fuck out. And, it, you know, like, I, yeah, there was a, or like, you know, like if, if a guy's being a creep, I for sure yelled at them and told them to get the fuck out. Okay. They don't always listen to me, but I've definitely okay. gotten in big fights with men who, like, there was a guy here who was stalking my friend and I, he tried to walk over and I was like, get the fuck away from me. Get the fuck away. Oh, just can't. I, no, <laughs> get the fuck away. <laughs> get the fuck out of here. Well, okay. Like, okay. Yeah, no, I, we know you're spirited now, but I want to hear, do you remember <laughs> any stories from 19 year old Megan Murphy bar fighting 18 year old? You guys well, get to drink at 18. They're not okay. good stories. They're okay. like me just being mean for no reason. Cause I had all this anger and didn't know where to put it. Or I would be like, or just being entitled, like I'm smoking in the bar and somebody's like, don't smoke in the bar. And I'm like, nah. like <laughs> that. It's just stupid oh, stuff. No. Stupid, like I, stupid stuff where I would have hated me. Then like, oh, you entitled brat hmm. Hmm. who doesn't know anything. Was there a point where you stopped that or you hit a wall in that period? <sighs> or, or, or otherwise I was thinking about your ambition <clears throat> kind of taking over you. And you start getting involved in a feminist collective and then start building something for yourself and start actually working rather than expending yourself. I think that exposure to radical feminism did help me quite a bit because I stopped being so confused about what I was mad about. Um, hmm. Cause I feel like I was trying to fit into some sort of idea that didn't fit and I didn't really understand why it didn't fit. And so I think I, I, feminism gave me a place to like put my anger um, <clears throat> and gave me some direction and some focus. Uh, you know, I started going to school. So I wasn't just like working at some shitty job that I hated yeah. and then, you know, going out to get drunk all the yeah. time. That wasn't the only purpose for my life. Yeah. Um, I started having a lot of other intellectual interests and goals, right? Yeah. Which is what yeah. everybody needs. Not necessarily intellectual, but goals. It, that's, there's something telling that you said where I'm going to summarize it. You didn't say this precisely, but it seems like feminism became a vessel for your anger. You got to put your anger into feminism. 
Well, it sort of explained some things to me, you know, like I had, I went through this time in my early twenties where I felt like I was like the cool girl and I was always hanging out with a bunch of dudes. And so, you know, I'd go to the strip club with them and I'd hate it. And I would feel really uncomfortable and depressed and grossed out and didn't really understand why because I saw that like these men seemed to like it. I saw women who claimed to like it. You know, I had friends who like had their birthday parties at a strip club and I was just like, this is not fun, but I didn't really know why I didn't like it. So once I sort of was able to develop like a, a, an analysis of that, a feminist analysis of that same thing with porn, right? Like I feel like during that time and now especially girls are totally encouraged to accept pornography um, to use pornography, to accept their partner's use of pornography, to nor- it's just a normal and masturbatory tool. It can be totally liberating and empowering. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the messaging that had already begun when I was a young woman. Um, and I hated pornography, and it, I found it really disturbing and gross, but I felt like I shouldn't. I felt like I should like it, and I didn't like it, but I didn't really know how to explain it. So there's all this stuff that I was angry about. You know, I was angry when I found my boyfriend was using pornography but didn't really know how to articulate why. Um, And yeah, and that just, I guess that feeling of feeling disempowered in the world, um, feminism sort of helped explain that a bit. There's obviously a lot more to it that I've learned more about as an adult, which is, you know, again, has a lot to do with sort of building skills and behaving, acting with integrity and, um, having healthy goals and doing things that are hard, you know, failing at something and trying again and getting better at it, um, being good at stuff. Right. Hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, (laughs) what was it that you were mad and sad about? (laughs) Uh, reality. Okay. I didn't hate the man. I didn't have a man cause I was the man. So I, I, had, to, <laughs> I had to hate God. I hated but, the man. White, 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 us white cis hetero men have no option. We can only hate God. So we're liberated from petty human concerns of You can oppression. hate women, apparently. Uh, I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of young men who are angry at the world try to direct that at women for a certain period of time because women won't fuck them or date them or treat them the way that they want to be treated. No. Uh, see, yeah, that was always if if, if women, yeah, go ahead and burp. But <laughs> yeah, from my point of view, anymore. again, like the locus of blame and responsibility is always internal for me, not external. I mean, other than God and and Father, right? <clears throat> Dad and God, like who those who caused me. So I'm I'm left with myself. So if if something, I I actually I. It's really hard for me to even think about framing failures with women as women's fault at all, because if something fails with the woman, it would be my fault. A woman doesn't have anything other than acceptance or denial over over my actions. Well, of course. But I don't you think that there's a lot of men who don't want to contend with the fact that it's their fault? I mean, there's a lot of people who don't want to blame themselves for their problems. They want to blame somebody else. So I feel like naturally some men would turn that around and be like women are bitches or they're superficial or whatever there there's <laughs> that and then there's also a contingent of the radical trans rights activist movement that continually goes around and beats up women and and has a glaring hatred for femininity or for the female for females right and so co-ops I think femininity so many radical feminists hate women and men is that like what are you saying uh, I, I was talking about radical trans rights activists. And, oh, radical and maybe, trans maybe rights activists. Heard, they, hate, uh, they hate women for sure. Yeah, in yeah. my brain, I tra- turned that into, wow, what revealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the interesting thing. So if, if, if certain actions of yours were working out relationship or deficiencies with your father, are certain other actions like or attitudes towards feminism, perhaps working out frustrations with your mother this is a huge psychological question you don't have to answer Mm, i don't know i mean my mother's pretty nice my issue nice (laughs) with my mother was that she tolerated my dad and i didn't want her to Mm. um did she like by tolerating like, like fix him or leave him no i wanted her to leave him i wanted her to like stand up more 
and was angry that she didn't divorce him. Which so is she, not... People she, always act like it's this terrible thing if parents get a divorce. But I remember when I was a kid, I always wanted them to get a divorce. Like People hmm. act like it's the best thing for parents to stay together for their kids, but not if the parents have a bad relationship or if the kids have a bad relationship with a, a parent, I think. Well, so did you want her to leave him more for you or for her? Thinking um, child, child, I think more for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, but also like I, I felt like she was too passive and I wanted her to stand up for more. Okay. And, like, so feminism more, gave you the, uh, a roadmap to being, uh, active in the world. Then, and not rather than passive. passive. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and not like just sitting around silently and accepting bullshit. Although I don't think I was ever like that. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> but certainly feminism probably empowered that part of me. Yeah, yeah. But um, so why the, why the uh, dislike of certain brands of feminism? I guess, or maybe feminist behavior? What do you mean? Well, you've, you've repeatedly in this particular interview and prior interviews expressed not fear nor loathing nor phobia, but discontent with certain sorts of female pattern behavior within this thing called feminism and even up to the feminism most closely aligned to your ideological beliefs being radical feminism. Oh, I guess, I mean, I think, I don't know <clears throat> if this is a woman thing or what, I think it's just an ideology slash movement slash activism thing. I think feminism gets as culty and as woke as any other area of like woke politics, the left, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're attached to all yeah. the woke mantras and ideologies with the exception of trans activism for the most part. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, sex work is work, perhaps if we're talking about radical feminists, but liberal. I mean, feminist, a lot yeah. of women in radical yeah. feminism, I think, turned out to be you know, pretty, I hate to stereotype, but I mean, I think this is just true of people who spend too much time online and not enough time in real life in general. Um, angry, unhappy, bitter people who want to tear down people who are not like that. You know, like I think a lot of what women don't like about me, women in, in radical feminism don't like about me is that I won't be bullied and pushed around, you know, like if they try to sort of force me into a box, I'm like, nope, don't care. And hmm. you're still going to say what I want. But I think also that I'm happy and. Do you, you know, enjoy being disliked? No, I don't feel, I don't feel disliked. I feel, I don't feel like most of the world hates me or anything like that. I don't feel yeah. like I'm particularly unlikable, but I also, I really truly, I don't give a shit. I do not, I don't give a shit. Like, if somebody doesn't like me, then they cannot like me. There's nothing I can do about that. Like, I feel like that in real life, too. Like, some people, it seems like, you know, I don't like people. Why do I have to like everybody? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not nice to everybody. I don't have to be. I'm not. I don't have time for that. I don't want yeah, to. Like, if yeah. I don't like you. I'm not going to, like, go out of my way to be mean, but I don't have to like you. And if it seems like somebody doesn't like me for some reason, then I'm not going to put any energy into it. What can I do? If they have a problem with me that they want to talk to me about it, then they can knock themselves out. But I'm not going to waste yeah. any of my like brain energy worrying about or trying to figure out why somebody doesn't like me. They have the right to not like me. And yeah. the feminists who don't like me, I mean, I've just not been nice about it or I've just ignored it for so long that I think a lot of them have just given up on trying to, you know, troll me and harass me over it. Same thing with a lot of trans activists too. And a lot of the lefties, they just sort of gave up. Yeah. I just don't give a shit. I don't care. Like, well, don't like me, whatever. They took away your Twitter for several years, but I, I want to ask, since you, you bring up what you just brought up, your time with Kelly J. Keene in Texas. I saw a photo. Maybe maybe it was doctored Photoshop. Did you meet up with her at a Let Women Speak event? And Yeah. Yeah. So I went to Austin. You two have <laughs> certain overlapping characteristics in what you just said about an independence and a just not really caring about what other people think. You're you're doing what you're doing. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that Kelly J is confident in her strategy and what she's doing. And she's like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I think works. I think it is working. And I don't really care what these people say. I mean, my position is that people can do whatever they want. And if I don't like it, then I can do something different. Like, you know, as in as far as the feminist, you know, there's this debate in gender critical feminism. Um, I don't necessarily think that term is perfect, but whatever, that's what we're using. So fine. Um, around strategy and who we should be working with. They call it allying, but I don't think that, you know, engaging with somebody or platforming mm -hmm. somebody or them platforming you or whatever is allying per se. Um, but you know, it, it seems can, like can a, women share power? What do you mean? What does that mean? I just, I, I just wonder if women can share power and that's why uh, feminism tended to try to create something that was an equalization of power. I don't know what you're talking about. Can well, women uh, share power with who? I just, I'm, I'm trying to imagine, I'm reading between the lines here and I shouldn't be going here, but I'm just intuitively reading between the lines that you're a very strong character. KJK is a very strong character and it, I don't see you guys like making an alloy and, and actually being allies, just allying for a certain thing, but because you're oh, so right. yeah. strong I mean, we in like yourself. working by ourselves. We don't want to yeah. work with other people. Yeah. Like we work together in that, like we'll do a thing. She's my friend. Obviously I really like her a lot. We are in touch. We get along. We like, we'll do an event together. I'll do an event with her. She'll do an event with me. Yeah, I'll have okay. her on my channel. Yeah. Da -da -da -da. But no, I'm not going to join the standing for women club and she's not going to join the Megan Murphy. We're, we're <laughs> independents. I don't want to work with, I don't like working with other people like that closely. I've had so many bad experiences over the years. I've worked with so many women over the years and I'm just, I don't want to be beholden to anybody but myself. That's why I, I do everything myself. That's why okay. I won't, I won't even yeah. like, I don't want anybody even helping me with anything. You don't I'm have like, an editor. Nope, I don't trust people anymore. Somebody to help you with your microphone. Everything by myself and be busy and stressed and broke than <laughs> have somebody else help me and then have to deal with their fucking personality problems. Every once in a while, I, I have like this very short daydream of getting hired by a consortium of people who would like arrange all of the financial structure so I can just do interviews. But I'm like, like just thinking like Daily Wire reaches out to me. Oh, Benjamin Boyce, we want you to do the podcast and we'll, we'll set you up with the studio and da, 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 da. I'm like, I don't want to work for anybody. I don't want to work for anybody. I don't want to work for anybody. What, like yeah. it's great to be like curated and confident and like structured and stuff, but like I don't want to exist in a structure. Even 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 uh, you know you probably get these emails. People are like, oh, you want to promote our product on your show? I'm like, I don't want to be beholden to anybody. I want to cut the interviews in, cut the interviews out. If people want to donate to Megan Murphy or to me, links yeah. to donating are down there in the description. I'll be crowdsourced and stuff like that, but I can't, I just can't. Yeah, that, yeah, I feel exactly the same way. And that's why I haven't like solicited ads or funding or anything like that. And I like every, sometimes I'll have like these panics, like what if I can't keep doing this by myself so, for some reason or whatever, like, um, or like, you know, it would feel more secure working for somebody else, but I don't want to, like, I like, I like what I do and I like that I can do it in the way that I want to do it on my own weird time and schedule. And yeah, I don't want to be beholden to anybody and be dealing with their deadlines and their, you know, ideas about how things should be done and yeah, produced yeah. and so yeah. on and so forth. So main, yeah, I mean, maintaining your independence obviously has its risks. problems and, yeah. and for sure risks, mostly financial. Um, and you know, if you lose your platform, you're fucked because you don't have, the Daily yeah. Wire or, yeah. you know, Barry Weiss's Substack or whatever. But yeah. I mean, luckily yeah. we all have Substack now. And as far, so far, Substack is actually genuinely committed to free speech. So that's really great. But, in, you know, like I'm constantly scared that, you know, I'll get kicked off of YouTube or something like that. Yeah, they they uh, they were getting close to kicking me off YouTube, which is oh, a yeah? huge, <laughs> that's like the, that's the mainstay of like, I do this because of YouTube, because YouTube allows me to do this. 
And uh, they were like, they, they started giving me like these warnings and then strikes and stuff like that. It was kind oh, of scary, no. but they, they kind of backed up. It, it was leading up to the election. They always get kind of trigger happy with the election and stuff because they're okay. basically owned by the powers that be. But did they can, tell you what you were getting strikes for? Like, did they say you can't say this or well, something like that? Well, it, it, well, they they selected an interview that I did with a woman in 2020 who I was going to talk about radical feminism from the perspective. Well, I had her on to talk about radical feminism from the perspective of a black woman in radical feminism. And she turned out to be a QAnon nut. Like, uh, you know, thought that, you know, Trump was saving Who was the world this from. Person? It's just this random woman. And it, it blew me away. The conversation blew me away. But because I'm you're gay, like, Ugh. I didn't publish it. And then a oh, okay. couple of years later, I published it because I'm like, this is actually a really interesting historical viewpoint into this way of thinking. And they said that it was something about harassing people online or participating in Internet harassment or something like that, which didn't make sense to me. I guess you can't criticize Hillary huh. Clinton. And call her a uh, Satanist, I guess you're not supposed to. And then they, they found another video there where a woman says why she didn't want to take a vaccine. And that wasn't even published. She just explained her reasons. And they're like, you have a strike now. We're, we're su suspending you from the platform. They reversed that. I had a human being, so-called, review the algorithm and they... Retracted yeah. their decision. They don't want you talking about vaccines, anything about the vaccine. I got I got my first strike over <clears throat> the vaccine thing, and they also reversed it when I appealed because I was like, she didn't even say, like, she didn't say anything negative about the vaccine. Yeah. I mean, she was super critical of the lockdowns. She's an Australian journalist. Um, she writes for The Spectator. Who? Um, Alexandra, I can't remember her last name. She writes for The Spectator. She's Australian. Um, but yeah, she, the, and I, I went through the whole thing cause I was like, yeah. I, cause it was like a health misinformation yeah. something or other. And I was like, what could this possibly be? And I, the only thing that she said about the vaccine was that she thought that people should basically have the option to get this vaccine if they want, but the government wasn't letting them have access cause they were forcing the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, some people might feel like this vaccine is safer than that vaccine so that they should be able to have access to that vaccine if she wants, not just like you forcing this because you guys bought a bunch from Pfizer and need to get rid of the supply. Um, <clears throat> Someday she we're going to see what happened and be able to talk about it. The day is not nigh, but it's pretty crazy stuff what we went through. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And it's pretty amazing how many people are still, I guess we're on YouTube, we shouldn't be talking about the vaccine, we'll get a strike. Um, it's pretty amazing how many people still want to stick to the narrative pre all the information that we have now <laughs> about, you know, the fact that the vaccine doesn't stop the spread, that it's not necessary. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't say it. The vaccine works. <laughs> Take the vaccine. Yeah, everybody, get, get vaxxed. Booster. Yeah, get wear 17 booster. masks every time you leave mask the house. Up. Can can I if can I tell you a story? Says mask out to me again. I'm gonna mask oh, out. I'm gonna threaten mask somebody out. with violence. So I'm not gonna oh, say yeah, that that's either. another thing that you can't do on YouTube. <laughs> can Can I tell you a Christmas memory? Sure. Okay, this is really sad, and then and then I want either your happiest or saddest Christmas memory. And then we'll end. I, gotta I guess get to we bar, can. Eh? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, let's do this and then... I know I invited myself onto your stream and now I'm like, hey, gotta go. <laughs> okay, I... Well, okay. What do you... Is, tell me what... How many... Do you want to hear are my Are there feelings? things that you... Yes, so I this thing is, Christmas story. Okay, okay. So, I was 13. Of course you want to tell a sad story, you weirdo. This is so sad. I hate this sad is, I have stories. to... Because I... I'm, I, I uh, anyway, so I was 13. My grandparents came down to visit. And, uh, it was Christmas uh, Eve, right? And I couldn't sleep all night because I was so anxious about what I was going to get for Christmas. Mm. And I'm 13. I was just, I couldn't stop thinking about getting what was in there. I'm like, what is it? 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 So I, I finally fall asleep. And then like two hours later we get up and we go and we're doing the thing where everybody's like getting their present and stuff. And I finally get mine and my mom hands me my big gift, right? 
And I opened it up and it was a bunch of Legos, like a space Lego sp- set. Cool. I love Legos. And I'm like devastated because I'm I guess 13. You're 13 and you don't I'm love like, Legos. I was like, like, cool Legos, but I guess I, I, I stayed up all night worrying about this and my mom saw my face and she was so sad to this day. She keeps Aww. on bringing it up and I'm so sad, mom. Thank you for loving me so much. It was just not age feeling. appropriate. It wasn't. It wasn't your fault. It was. How did was, she not know you so well that she would think that at thirteen you would want a Lego set? Though? I'm. I'm her baby. You know, like she. She always thinks of me as this creative kid. She tells this story. Last story, and then it's your turn. I don't. She tells the story. Okay. Okay. She but. tells this story when I was two. I was still the only child, or maybe she was pregnant with my brother. And she comes in. I. I. I run out of my room and I get her. I'm like. Little baby Benjamin comes up to her and says, Mom, come come here. I need to show you something. I need to show you something. And I bring her to my room, and I built this whole city out of blocks. Like, I had a bunch of blocks, and I built this structure out of blocks. And she's like, oh, that's really cool, or whatever. She's really amazed. And then I look at her, I'm like, thank you. And then, can you leave now? And then I dismiss her for some reason. So, she thinks I'm a builder. Uh, I mean, she's... Probably not wrong. Well, sure. is there something that you really wanted? Like you must have, you were hoping for a thing, and you're disappointed that you. Well, didn't there was get no it. i i iPads back then. There's no iPhones. I probably wanted like a computer or something like that. This was in thirteen, mm. so seventy six plus. Uh, so this is eighty nine, nineteen eighty nine. So we did get a computer about that time and stuff. So right. I, you this, had a computer I, in nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, it is. I don't. I feel like there wasn't a computer in our house, and I didn't use that. Computer it was until from like Radio Shack. It was called a Tandy. Yeah, six. it was a very rudimentary uh, thing. I learned to code back then, but I didn't have the attention. Yeah, span those computers were through. awful. My parents got a computer when because they were in university when I was a teenager, basically to you know do some of their work, but to access the like library system, and it was like dial up and it's like <laughs> and then all these like numbers and symbols across the screen for half my an pronouns hour. are 56k <laughs> modem connecting to the internet god it's painful do you have any christmas memories sound. we have to do at least one christmas memory i my memory is full of love even though it's sad because i love my mom and it was just like i, I had to tell somebody about that so do you have any christmas mm. memories hot chocolate i love candies. christmas songs on Monday night, I got back from Tulum. I got back. <laughs> back to karaoke. Tulum. Full circle, photos. Yep. You can hardly tell what I like in life. <laughs> I got home at midnight. So my plane got into PV at 1040 and we made back to Sayulita in record time. I went up to the bar to see my friends and then we came back to my house and sang Christmas songs in my apartment Aww. and it was so fun. What's your fl- favorite Christmas song? All I want for Christmas is you. How does it go? Is that the one that gets canceled? Oh, you want me to sing a Mariah Carey song? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Just give me the melody. Give me the melody. I don't want a lot for Christmas. <laughs> There's just one thing I need. Oh, I don't care about the presents underneath my the christmas tree i just want you for my own more than you would ever know what more can i do <laughs> all i, I want is all christmas all i want for christmas is you Ooh, baby. oh man please can you please can I, can I make one request tonight as you I go off and we're, gonna, we're rapping that. <laughs> that was so beautiful can you please sing a christmas song at karaoke tonight please yeah I'll for sing baby that jesus one. sing it to baby jesus I'll okay sing that one all right <sighs> now i feel like ready to go <laughs> okay <laughs> we're done revved <laughs> say goodbye to the chat thanks chat for showing up Thanks for tuning in. Sorry about that, Mariah and everybody else. (laughs) 